All right, let's turn to, um, let's turn to Romans chapter 3 and verse 27, just to set a few things up. The Bible says healing is the children's bread. It belongs to us. The book of Hebrews says it is finished. It's already done. Jesus said it's finished. The price has been paid. Glory to God. Hallelujah. When Jesus says, Father, forgive them, he may as well have said, Father, heal them. <laughs> because healing and forgiveness go hand in hand, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight. The connection between healing, forgiveness, and faith. Amen? All right. Romans chapter 3 and verse 27. The Bible says, without faith it's impossible to please God, and faith is the hand with which we receive from God. God has provided by his grace, and it is, a, it is a faith that it might be according to grace. So grace will flow when the channel of faith is in place. Amen? Amen. Now Romans chapter 3 and verse 27 says, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No. But by the law of faith. But by the law of faith. This verse of scripture calls faith a law. Calls faith a law. The thing about laws is that laws are not respecters of person. In other words, there's a law called gravity. And whether you believe in gravity or you do not believe in gravity, if you step off a cliff, you hit the ground. Amen? It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what your religion is. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter whether you're old, young, or, or what your race is, your intellect. None of those things matter. The law is the law. Amen? And ignorance is not an excuse to escape the consequences of the law. All right. So this here calls it the law of faith. Amen. In fact, I'm reminded that Romans 8 and verse 2 speaks about the law of the spirit of life in Christ. There is a law that will cause the life of Christ to flow and operate in the life of a believer. Similarly, it, it goes on to say in Romans 8 and verse 2 that there is a law of sin and death. There is a law that governs sin and death. When you can learn to operate in the law of the spirit of life in Christ, you can walk in healing and health. But if you don't and you operate in the law of sin and death, you can operate in sickness and disease. Amen? You operate in the law of the spirit of life in Christ, you can operate in prosperity. You operate in the law of sin and death, you can operate in the curse and in poverty. So there are laws. And the Bible says, the Bible, Jesus said that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The Amplified says, calls it, that we are to pursue and seek first the kingdom of God and God's way of doing things and being right. In other words, let's find out God's system. Let's find out how God operates. Let's find out what are the laws are, and then let's line up with the laws. Amen? Now, which is not to make um, the things of faith and the things of God um, a matter of, 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 of legalities. Which is not to make it, I don't want us to try to take things like prayer and things like faith and many of these, these things. Um, you know, when principles are taught, it is not that we must go to step one, two, three, four, five, and six, as much as it's a practical way to teach, because ultimately it's, it comes out, it flows out of a relationship. But they are principles and they are laws, and I want to establish that fact. And here, Romans 3, verse 27, speaks about the law of faith. So I want us to talk about some things about the law of faith, and especially as it relates to healing and as, and as the issue of forgiveness comes into play. Amen. Again, just to emphasize this issue of law, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, a, a verse that we're, we're quite familiar with, which says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now, many of us are familiar with that scripture, but we aren't familiar with the rest of that scripture. That's only one part of that scripture. The rest of the scripture says, my, well, let me read the whole verse. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, and seeing that you have forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Now, is God being harsh? Is God being mean? It says, if you, because you've forgotten the law of my, thy God, I will also forget thy children. In other words, God is saying, there are laws. And when you violate those laws, it affects the results. It affects your harvest. 
it affects God's ability to move in your life, to move in your family. Amen? Because, you know, whether we like it or not, God has given the earth, given man dominion on the earth. And, it, and, it, and, and you know, as, as one great man of God said, it seems that God does nothing in the earth unless somebody prays. God had to set up a number of covenants. <coughs> Once he had turned the, the world over, the earth over to Adam, and Adam sinned and turned things over to the devil, God had to set up covenants so that he could have a legal right to operate in the earth by man giving him permission and cooperating with him. Are you with me? All right, so what am I saying? So the issue of faith is a law, and if we don't, op and if we violate the law, there are consequences. The consequences that we will not get the right results. We not, will not get the desired results. Amen? So, all right, so let's talk some things about faith. But in order to do that, let's look at a, at, at, um, a classic story here in Mark chapter 11. Where Jesus cursed the fig tree, something we're very familiar with. Now, when we talk of Mark chapter 3, the verses that most people are familiar with is verse 22 to verse 26. Most people are familiar with the fact that where it says, Have the God kind of faith, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he said. Therefore, whatever you desire when you pray, believe you receive it and you shall have it. And if you, and then he goes on to say, but if you, and when you stand praying, forgive. Amen? Now, and those are what people are aware of, and that's important. Now, we're going to look at that, but let's, let's kind of look at this whole story that led to Jesus speaking these, the, these words that are, that are great instructions on how to operate in faith and how to operate the law of faith and principles concerning the law of faith. Let's go all the way back to um, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 11, verse 11. Amen? Glory to God. And Jesus said, in, in verse 11, And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. He entered into the temple. And when he had looked around upon all, he looked around at all things, and now the evening tide time, or the evening tide, which is evening time, was come. And he went out into Bethany, with the twelve. So let's get this picture. Jesus enters into Jerusalem and he entered into the temple. And while he was there in the temple, the Bible says he looked, he looked round about upon all things. The Amplified says, when he had looked around, surveying and observing everything. So this was not something Jesus did in a few minutes. And the Bible says he remained there until evening time. Amen? He remained there, on the Amplified says, until it was already late. So Jesus spent a lot of time going around the temple, looking at what was going on. Now, what was going on in the temple? They were basically gambling. They were basically, they had made the house of God um, a, a, a place of merchandising. They had, they, they were, in today's context, they were pretty well having bingo. In the house of God. Or, 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 or gambling of some, of some sort. Amen? Blackjack and whatever else. You know, selling sheep and goat and fowls and all of that. And, and, and all this swindling happening. Now that was obviously grievous to Jesus' heart. And Jesus observed it all. This is Jesus. Who loves the Father. Who loves righteousness. And who hates iniquity. And he observes all of this. Now, here is a very, and he says nothing. The Bible does not record him saying anything. Now, it's interesting, on the, one, on the one hand, at this particular point in time, Jesus had already done several miracles. And wherever Jesus went once, he showed up, and especially in the temple, people would flock to him. People would bring the sick to him. People would come to him with questions. But this time, there was no one coming to him. That means that God must have done a miracle right here, so the here was Jesus in the midst, and Jesus, God had somehow miraculously shielded him so that no one recognized him. The same on, on, on a few occasions when they would try to push Jesus off the, off the cliff, Jesus would just disappear in their midst. Amen? That's a miracle. It's a miracle for Jesus to be in the house all day until evening, and no one sees him or observes him or anything like that. But what I want you to see is not that so much as this. Jesus observing the sin 
observing the abuse, observing the, 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 the way they were disrespecting the father, disrespecting the house, disrespecting the temple. Jesus, who the Bible says love righteousness and hate iniquity, said nothing about it. Now, does that mean that Jesus didn't have strong feelings about what he was seeing? Obviously he did. But why did he say nothing about it? The Bible says that Jesus only spoke what the Father gave him to say. And he only did what he saw the Father do. So the Father didn't give him anything to say. The, but the Father didn't show him anything to do at that point. So what did he do? He did nothing. He said nothing. Now that's a very good word in and of itself. Because as you and I come on and eat the dominion of the Holy Spirit, we do not judge the way, the, the way that men does judge according to the appearance of the eye. But we judge righteously. We judge after God. We judge with the mind of Christ. We judge by letting the Holy Spirit give us, give us discernment and letting him show us what to do. Amen? The Bible says, lay no hand suddenly and no man. In other words, the Bible says, don't be quick to rush to judgment. In other words, what is he saying? He's saying, wait on the counsel of the Lord. Seek the wisdom of God. Let the Holy Spirit direct your step. Are you with me? And here you can see Jesus operating in that. Now that's going to be very important because you will notice it is out of this mindset that later on Jesus is going to operate in faith and curse the fig tree. Which tells us, that yes, there are times that we need to, to speak faith and we need to do it just in a spot. And especially when we've been learning to operate in, in, in and by the Holy Spirit. Yes, there are times where we got to do something quickly. But many other times we can learn to walk in such a relationship with the Holy Spirit, develop that intimacy with Him, develop that dependency on Him, amen, that we literally learn to wait on Him and speak the words that He gives us to say. Amen? And let our yea be yea and our nay, nay. And pack those words with the power of God and the anointing of God that will blast any fig tree right out of its ground. <laughs> Amen? But anyway, but I want you to see that. So anyway, one verse 12. And on the morrow, so anyway, so on evening time, when evening time come, he went out, he left the temple, and he went out onto Bethany with the twelve. He was in Jerusalem, he headed over to Bethany. A few miles away. And on the mor morning, that's the next morning, when they were come from Bethany, heading back to Jerusalem, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves. So the fig tree was afar off, having leaves, and he came to it. If happily he might find anything thereon, he was hungry, and he thought, well, this fig tree might have some, some figs in it. But when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves because the time of figs was not yet. Now, a couple of observations here. This fig tree was afar off. That means it wasn't at the side of the road. It was a, a little bit way out there into the fields. Amen? <coughs> so much so that he couldn't, um, he couldn't clearly, with his natural eyes, distinguish whether it had fruit tree, whether it had fruit of it or not. So he literally came out of his way, went across to the fig tree, and when he got there, there was nothing but leaves. And the Bible says, you know, it's going to go on to say he cursed the fig tree. Now, him cursing the fig tree was not, was not a road rage type reaction. It's not like Jesus got upset, Jesus flipped out because he was hungry, and now there's no leaves, and now he's disappointed, and he's upset, and he's taken out on the tree. That's not what happened. He only did what he, what he saw the Father did, and he only spoke what the Father gave him to say. So him cursing the fig tree means the Father was cursing the fig tree. You follow me? But you see that fig tree was both a type of the nation of Israel who had failed in their responsibility and in their walk of the covenant. They had failed in walking in the covenant uprightly. They had failed and they had been there. And again, exactly what Jesus saw in the temple, the, the scribes and the Pharisees had taken the, the laws of God and had made them, and, and they had literally brought them to naught with their vain traditions. Amen? And, in, and in, so when Jesus cursed the fig tree, he was cursing that system that had failed to produce any kind of fruit. And he was declaring that this system will no longer be accepted. In fact, the Father God is going to do away with this system. And you know he did. 
and there's going to come the new covenant. Amen? Are you with me? So that Jesus was literally, that was also a prophetic act when he cursed the fig tree. And at the same time, of course, the fig tree also addresses, um, is symbolic of the fig leaves that Adam, with his own self-effort, tried to use to cover his nakedness. The fig, the fig leaves of man's self-righteousness, man's sufficiency in himself, amen, which is not acceptable before God. God is our source. We are to depend on him. So Jesus did that, amen? All right, let's continue. And Jesus answered and said unto him, No man eat fruit from thee hereafter forever. Now Jesus didn't whisper this. The disciples heard it. And his disciples heard it. And they, now, now again, here's a nice, little, a nice little thing about faith. We're talking about the law of faith here. Faith doesn't have any shame. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, what if I curse this fig tree and the fig tree don't die? And I mean, are you saying this in front of all your disciples? You're going to lose their respect. Can you imagine the devil whispering that to Jesus? <laughs> right? right? You see, faith doesn't have any shame. Faith is bold. Amen? Faith has a bold confession. And boldness is, 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 is a manifestation of mature faith. Of faith it is a manifestation of faith in its fullness. So Jesus was bold. He had no shame. The Bible speaks about, the, uh, 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 about importunity. The fellow who came at midnight to an ex-friend to get some bread because someone had come to his house and he didn't have bread to feed him. And the Bible says the friend would not have, didn't want to come out, given that it was midnight and he was in bed at sleep with his kids. But nevertheless, because of his friend's importunity, because of his friend's boldness and having no shame to come at his house at, his house at midnight, and because of that bold face, shame, shameless mindset, his friend got up and gave him however much he needed. Amen? It's the same thing with the woman, the, the woman who came to the unjust judge in, in Luke, I believe, in chapter 18. When she came, and, and, and because of her persistence, because of, she had no shame, she decided, I'm going to get some justice from this unjust, wicked judge. And I'm going to stand here, I'm going to sit here outside of his office from now until the cows come home, but I'm going to get some justice. And the Bible says, he decided that, you know what, I better give this lady some justice before she wear me out. <laughs> Amen? But, you know, she had a bold face, no shame. And Jesus concerning him, Jesus is going to make the statement in Luke chapter 18 that when he returns, will he find faith in the earth? Will he can find that type of boldness, that type of no shame, that type of perseverance that is not concerned about what people think? Amen? It's only concerned about what God thinks. And just saying whatever God has said. You with me? So that's a good observation. We're talking about the law of faith. We're talking about things that operate this law. Amen? So, anyway, and verse 11, and so they came to Jerusalem. So he cursed the fig tree. They went to Jerusalem. Jesus went into the temple, and he began to cast them out that sold and bought in the temple. And he over overthrew the tables of the money changers, and he's only doing what he saw the Father did. Are you with me? And the seats of them that sold doves. And he would not suffer or allow any to carry any kind of vessel through the temple and he taught them saying saying unto them is it not written that my house shall be called of all nations a house of prayer but you have made it a den of thieves and the scribes and the pharisees heard it they were probably the ones running the bingo <laughs> and sought how they might destroy him for they feared him because all the people was astonished at his doctrine and when evening was come he went out of the city, and he headed back to Bethany. And then in the morning, he's heading back to Jerusalem. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, look, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered. In other words, because they saw that the fig tree had dried up from the roots. Which is to say, from the inside out, from the bottom up, amen? Incidentally, that's how your healing comes about, from the inside out. 
The Bible says the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwells within you and shall quicken your mortal body. The healing power and the virtue of God lies within your born again spirit and that's where it flows from and flows out into your body if it can have a channel of faith and nothing to hinder it. Amen? And if the law of faith operates correctly, it comes from the inside out. And it is working sometimes even when it doesn't look like it's working. That faith began to work in that fig tree the moment Jesus cursed it. The disciples didn't notice. They went to Jerusalem. They went back. They didn't notice it, anything at the time when, they, when he cursed it. But the next day when they begin to see the symptoms of it withering, then they say, huh, whoa, look at it, Peter said. The fig tree which you cursed, it withered away. And Jesus answered and said unto Pe answered them. This lesson was not just for Peter, but it was for all of them, and it is for all of us. He says, have faith in God. He says, have the God kind of faith. He says, have faith in, this, in God's system, in the kingdom. And then he went on to explain, Verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. Therefore, because that's how it operates, Believe in your heart and say with your mouth. Therefore, I am saying unto you that whatsoever you desire when you pray or when you ask, believe that you receive and you shall have. Believe you receive, believe you receive them and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. And they come again to Jerusalem. All right. Now Jesus explained the operation of faith and what they had just noticed on the fig tree. He says this is the faith of God in operation. And here is how the faith of God works. You've got to be able to believe in your heart. You've got to be able to speak with your mouth to that situation. You've got to act upon the word. And then you got to believe that what you say shall come to pass. And then he went on to say, and whatever it is you desire, believe you receive it. Believe you got it and you shall have it. And not only that, but while you are standing praying, forgive. And he says, if you don't. Hallelujah. Amen. So, so he said. When you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against any that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. And if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. And Jesus described a number of, what should I say, items or principles that is involved in the operation of faith. Amen? Let's just identify a few of them. Now, and again, let me mention this. This which Jesus went through here as he operated in faith, I believe when he was there walking in, walking in the temple, observing what was going on, obviously the, 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 what he saw in the temple had really created a, a righteous indignation within him. But nevertheless, he did nothing and he said nothing because all the time he was looking to the Spirit of God and trying to find out, well, how am I to respond? What am I to do? And he recognized that I'm going to have to move in this situation. I'm going to have to deal with this situation. I am going to have to execute judgment in this situation. But the Bible says, even in the execution of judgment, you've got to be able to execute judgment with wisdom and, and, and with mercy. Amen? You've got to be able to execute judgment. And the Bible says, if you see your brother overcoming a fault, you better be careful. You need to go correct him. But you better do it in a spirit of humility and make sure that in the process that you do not become overcome, that you don't fall into some judgmental attitude, you don't fall into some situation where you think you are so much better than him. Amen? The Bible says, let him that think it he, 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 let him that think it he stand, take he lest he fall. So even in executing judgment, which is necessary, it needs to be done correctly. It needs to be done in faith. And that faith must not be short-circuited. So Jesus was thinking, all right, I'm going to have to deal with this situation, but I'm going to have to do this one right. And this is a testy situation because I'm going to have to go in there, turn all these tables upside down, drive all these money changes out of there, and I'm going to have to do it with boldness in a spirit of authority by the anointing of God, but I am going to have to do it and not violate the law of love. And even as I'm doing, I, I got to forgive. 
Can you see that? In other words, he had to think about this to make sure he did it right. And then after he, and then, and then, so after the, and in a way, all of that stuff was in him at the same time when he dealt with the fig tree. So yes, there was something prophetic regarding him cursing the fig tree. But at the same time, I believe what was in him and those very principles concerning faith that he was meditating on also came out against the fig tree. And now here he explains what it is, what are some of the steps involved in faith. Can you see that? And so he says, first of all, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt it, his heart shall believe. He says, number one, you got to believe. You got to believe. Amen. Before you go cursing fig trees, <laughs> you better believe. <laughs> Amen. You got to believe. And you see, your believing, your believing comes from where? Your heart. Where the heart man believes. Your believing comes from your heart, comes from your spirit, comes from your inner man. And then he says, uh, and, and whosoever shall, and then he got to, <clears throat> whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, <clears throat> and shall not doubt in his heart, who shall and shall not. This issue of I believe, I believe, but at the same time, you've got to make some decisions. As to what you're going to do. You're going to have to make a decision to curse that fig tree. You're going to have to set your face like flint. You're going to have to decide, I believe God. This is what I'm going to stand. And you're going to have to set your will in harmony with your believing. Amen. You follow me? Amen. Before you put your foot on that accelerator, at least point the car in the right direction. <laughs> you follow me? Don't go, go put your foot on the accelerator and the car is in reverse. And you're against a fence. <laughs> you, you got me? All right. Because action is coming next. First, I believe. Second, I will. Now, I got to put my foot on the accelerator and get this car moving. Which means what? You got to take it. In other words, and he says you got to believe you receive what it is you desire. And to believe you receive is to take it. It's like, a, it's, like a, it's like a receiver in a football game. The ball is thrown, and he has to dive and catch that ball and pull it in and make sure the defense don't rip it, up, rip it out from him. Because the devil don't want you taking anything from God. The devil don't want you. You see, this taking is what James called corresponding action. Faith without works is dead. Faith without a right corresponding action. But look at this here. You've got your... Spirit involved by believing. You've got your will involved with your soul by deciding this is what I'm going to do. And setting your heart and your mind and your will and your emotions in the line. And this is what I'm going to do. And then number three, you've got your body in line by taking action. So that your spirit, soul, and body, the three are agreeing in one. And the Bible says a threefold cord shall not easily be broken. The Bible says where two or three shall agree on earth as touching anything, it shall be done. Amen? It's good to get your body, your mind, your soul, your heart, and all of them agreeing on the word of God and on the promises of God. That's what faith, that, that's how faith works. Can you see that? So he says, I believe, I will, I'll take it. And then he says, now if, you, if you're going to believe and you will and you take it, then you got to believe that you have what it is you desired. So now you say, I have it. And that's your confession of faith. Thank God that by his stripes I'm healed. In the name of Jesus, this fig tree will bear no more fruit forever. There ain't no more fruit coming out of that fig tree. This fig tree will not rise up a second time. It's been cursed from the roots. You follow me? And that be, now your confession of faith is I am a father of many nations. And you say that. And you keep confessing that for how long? Until the manifestation comes. The same way God confessed that, that, the, that the seed of the woman was going to bruise the head of the serpent and that Jesus is going to come into the earth. And he confessed that for 4,000 years before Jesus was actually born of Mary. But do you know something after he was born of Mary? He didn't have to confess that anymore. Amen? Are you with me? Now he's confessing his return, though. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I believe. I will. I take it. I have it. That's my confession. Are you with me? With the mouth, confession is made unto. And then after that, if you believe you receive it and you have it, I think it's only decent for you to say thanks. Don't you think so? 
The Bible says in, in Psalms 50 and verse 32 that they forget to forget not God. When you thank, when you operate in thanksgiving, what you are doing is you are remembering that God did it. You are de declaring that it is done. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 says, with all prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20 says, giving thanks always. Amen? Giving thanks to God. So the issue of thanksgiving is a good thing. In fact, Romans chapter 1 verse 21, speaking about people that, were, that did not acknowledge God as God and they were ungrateful, they were unthankful. In Romans 1, 21, because they were unthankful, the Bible says their foolish heart became darkened. In other words, because of them being not having an attitude of gratitude and an attitude of thanksgiving, their heart became insensitive, their heart became cold, their heart became dry, their heart became like a fallow ground where they were not in a position to be able to receive from the Lord, receive revelation knowledge, hear the voice of God. That's why the Bible says today, if you hear my voice, hard not your heart. So maintaining an attitude of thanksgiving is an important aspect of faith. So we've talked about a few things that already has to do with this law of faith, I believe. Right? Getting your spirit involved. I will. Getting your soul involved. I take it. Getting your body involved. Corresponding action. I have it. Your confession. Getting your mouth involved. And then, and then number five, I thanking God for what it is, the promise that you believe. Now, this will operate in any realm. We're talking about healing, but it will operate in any realm. And then Jesus goes on to say, I forgive. In other words, and then he says, when you stand praying, do what? Forgive. Well, how are you going to forgive when you stand praying? By saying, I forgive. By forgiving. That's how you forgive. You forgive by forgiving. Amen? You make a decision. You say, I forgive. And he say, I forgive. Now, what I want us to emphasize on is this last point. This issue of forgiving. Because this issue of forgiving is vital. In other words, Jesus actually finished this passage of, of these laws or principles concerning faith with I forgive. And he says, if you don't forgive, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean my Father is not going to forgive me if I don't forgive? Well, in the old covenant, that's how it was. But in the new covenant, the Bible says in, 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 um, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, it says... And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake had forgiven you. So God has forgiven me for Christ's sake. Amen? Um, and Jesus had said in, Matthew, in Luke 23 verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So because of what Jesus said, because of Jesus' sacrifice, the Father forgives me and the Father forgives you. The Father forgives you even before you sin. The blood of Jesus covers all your sins, past, present, and future. So there is no problem with God forgiving you. Yet this scripture says, if you don't forgive, the Father will not forgive you. How does that apply in the new covenant? It applies from this standpoint. God extends forgiveness towards you. God has already forgiven you. God says, I will remember your sins and your iniquities no more. Right? And, 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 I mean, and the Bible says in, in um, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14, that you have been sanctified and set apart forever. He has perfected you forever. So what do you mean um, he will forgive, that, that, um, that, that neither will the Father forgive me? It's not that in the new covenant the Father will not forgive you, but that forgiveness flows through a channel of faith. And unforgiveness will block up that channel. Forgiveness operates by the law of faith. And then when you don't forgive, the faith law is short-circuited. And when the faith law is short-circuited, even though the grace of forgiveness is there, it can't get to you. So God is forgiving, but it doesn't operate. Because faith and forgiveness, forgiveness is part of the law of faith. That is why Jesus didn't leave it out. Amen? Are you with me? In fact, turn with me to Matthew chapter, chapter um, 9. All right, now we're going to spend the remaining time looking at this issue of forgiveness. It's really important because it, it directly affects your faith, and that is the arm with which you receive from the Lord. Amen? That is the arm, or that is the channel through which the grace of your healing comes, or the grace of your prosperity. Amen? Or the grace of the anointing, or whatever else. But especially in this area of, of, of healing. 
Now, in Matthew chapter 9, so let's get, uh, let's get this connection here as quickly as we can. Mark, Mark did I say what? Matthew chapter 9. Are you with me? Glory to God. Hallelujah. So Jesus had all these things in his mind. <laughs> when the fig tree came, he got in the way. <laughs> Amen. But thank God for the fig tree. We learned some good lessons, didn't we? Amen. And so did Israel. And so did Adam. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. But thank God for the free gift of righteousness, which is ours in Christ. All right, Matthew chapter 9, reading from verse 1. It says, And he entered in the ship, and he passed over, and he came into, into, into his own city. And behold, they brought unto him a man that is sick of the policy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, seeing their faith, and I believe this is the same man that was led down through the roof. Amen? That is recorded in Luke chapter 5, and it's recorded, I think, in Mark chapter 2. Seeing their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, and behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, says, Wherefore think ye evil in your heart? For which is easier, to say thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, then said he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed his house. Jesus said, I mean, you guys are thinking that I'm blaspheming because I've said to the man, Thy sins have been forgiven thee. And he says, Which is easier, to say your sins be forgiven you, or be healed? Jesus is saying, one is not any easier than the other. They're equal. In other words, you can be healed just as easily as you can, your sins can be forgiven. That's what Jesus was saying, was he not? Now, it is amazing that in a number of other scriptures supports this very principle. Where there is this connection between forgiveness of sins and healing. For instance, the Bible says in Psalms 103 and verse... Um, and in verse 3, who forgiveth, for, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, and who healeth all thy diseases. And he connects them right up to each other. In Isaiah chapter 50, 53, it, it, it says, um, let me read it. Isaiah chapter 53, reading from, reading from verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs, which means our sicknesses, and he's carried our sorrows, that's our diseases. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for what? Our transgressions. He just moved from sickness to transgressions. And he was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we heal. I mean, he talks from sickness, disease, transgressions, iniquities, healing, all in one breath. What is the point? Because as far as God is concerned, there ain't no difference. Why not? Here is why. Well, let me give you another scripture before we go. In 1 Peter chapter 2, where Peter was, was, more, was, was more or less by the Holy Ghost, given an interpretation of, of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 and 5. And this is how Peter put it in 1 Peter 2 and verse 24. Peter says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Well, Peter didn't mix any words. Peter didn't even bother talking about transgressions and iniquities. Peter just point blank says sins. Amen. <laughs> Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. And he connects healing in the same breath as sins. Amen. What is the point? Here is the point. The same sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for sins what is the same sacrifice that was made for sickness. The same blood that was shed for the forgiveness of your sins, the same blood was shed for your healing. The same body that took your sins also took your sickness. The same body that hung upon the cross that had to do with your sins also took your sickness. And as far as God, the anointing, the same anointing that brings healing, the same anointing brings forgiveness of sins. 
And so, in, and, and so then, there's a principle that, G God, that Jesus is pointing out here, even in Matthew chapter 9, and that is that the issue of forgiveness of sins and healing go hand in hand. Amen? The same power to forgive is the same power to heal. Well, if the same power to forgive is the same power to heal, let me put it another way. If the same anointing to forgive is the same anointing to heal, and Jesus could get you to flow in forgiveness, he'll get you to flow in healing. Can you see what I'm saying? So he's saying, look, when you release your faith and you curse the fig tree and you decide that I, will, I believe and I kept my soul inside of it, I will. And you, and, and, you, uh, and you take action and you take it and you declare and you confess that you have it and you thank God for it. When you've done all of that, forgive. Because when you forgive and you release your faith for forgiveness, you're also releasing your faith for your deliverance. Can you see that? Think on it a little bit. That is okay. Yes, okay, yes, fine. We're talking law. Let's talk law. Can we talk more law? <laughs> Amen. Let's turn to Luke chapter 6. Again, a passage we're familiar with. Give and it shall be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Do you know that law? Now hear how, how, how Jesus puts it. In verse 36, he says, Be ye therefore merciful. Well, in verse 35, he tells you love your enemies and do good and so on. And verse 36, be ye therefore merciful. Isn't forgiving somebody mercy? It's not based on whether they deserve it. I don't know. You don't know what they did to me. No, it's an act of mercy on your part. Amen? Your father has forgiven you a lot more. Again, you know the story in Matthew chapter 18 where, where there was this guy and he did not and he was forgiven millions of dollars. But then when someone had owed him a few dimes, he refused to forgive them and want them thrown into jail. And when the master found out about that, that same man that, was, that you had forgiven millions did not extend that mercy that you extend to him, to the person that, that had just owed him a few dimes, the master got upset and the master said, you know what, you get that wicked, wicked man and you turn him over to what? The tormentors. Amen? Unforgiveness will turn you over to the tormentors. Amen? Right? And the principle was there. In other words, you are to be, in other words, you sow mercy to reap mercy. Amen? That is why, okay, well, let me, let me say it. The Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16, that when you come boldly to the throne of grace, what are you coming for? That you might obtain, not hope or wish, that means that you might get a hold of what? Mercy and find grace. You want grace, but you also want mercy. Well, here we know how to get mercy, sow mercy. So forgiveness, and you are in good place to receive what? Both mercy and grace. Are you with me? Because the grace flows through faith. And that mercy, operating in mercy and forgiveness and love, activates the faith. Remember, faith works by what? That's the engine that drives it. So when you go and you operate in forgiveness, you are releasing your faith, you're operating in love, and faith goes to work. To what? To bring you the grace you need. And to kill the fig tree. Are you there? Alright. So, in Luke chapter 6, it says, Be there for mercy, your Father is also merciful. In verse 36, Judge not lest you be judged. Condemn not lest you be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given back to you. How? So when you give mercy, when you give forgiveness, what happened? It is given back to you. How? Good measure, Press down, shaking together, and what? Running over. Isn't that right? Now, in other words, God says, when you give, you know, we, we, we deal with it in the financial realm. You sow $10, and, God, and, you, get a, and you get a tenfold return, you get $100. Well, suppose that operated in the realm of forgiveness. Suppose that operated in the realm of mercy. You forgive a little bit, and you get forgiven a lot. You give, extend a little bit of mercy and a lot more mercy coming back to you. That's what this verse says. Give and it's going to give him back to you good measure, press down, shake it together, and run it over. In fact, the Bible says in, in, um, in, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 8, Jesus said by the Holy Ghost, knowing that whatever good that any man does, the same shall he receive of the Lord. 
There is no man that will give a cup of water in my name's sake that shall not receive a return. Amen? And in Matthew's, and in um, Mark chapter 10 and verse 29, Jesus put it this way. Have you ever heard about a hundredfold return? Well, look at Mark chapter 10 verse 29. It says, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left house, brethren, sister, father, mother, wife, children, or land, or has given whatever it is for my sake and the gospel. What do you mean for my sake? Did it for me. In other words, Jesus says, when you forgive, you're doing it for me, for him. When you show mercy, you're doing it for him. When you give a water, it's as if you give it to him. He says that when you forgive, you're doing it just for him. You're doing it just because he said so. You're doing it just because you believe in the gospel. And he says, when you do it for that reason, what happens? You will receive what? A hundredfold. Now, when now? <laughs> now when it is time to come, a hundredfold. Can you see that? When you do this, and look at it. Remember, again, the Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 32, the Father will forgive you for Jesus' sake, because of Jesus. Well, let's forgive for Jesus' sake too, just like the Father did. Isn't that right? Are you with me? All right, I got to speed up now. All right, but the point I'm trying to make is, this issue of forgiving is a way it is directly connected with your healing, it is connected with the grace, and the grace flows, the healing flows, the provision flows, the anointing flows, and it flows as you release your faith, and forgiving releases your faith. And that's the emphasis I'm making, that the very act of forgiving releases your faith. Amen? The very act of forgiving releases your faith. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, Let the love of Christ constrain you. Let the love of Christ control you. Let the love of Christ motivate you. It is out of love for Jesus that I forgive. Not because the person is deserving. Not because they even ask for it. Not because they apologize. Are you with me? Or, or, or not because I'm hurt. Uh, because I'm, I've, I've overcome my hurt. I may not have overcome my hurt, but I'm forgiving for Jesus' sake because he said so. And for the sake of the gospel. And the love of Christ constrains me. Amen? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, let me, let me, let me, let me. Okay, yes. Yeah, Turn to read Mark chapter 5. We can get this in here and we can pull it together. Mark chapter 5. I'll tell you the story. You know it. Mark chapter 5. Let me say this first. We are talking some general principles regarding the law of faith and the way that faith connects up to your healing and forgiveness. Amen? But let's be a little bit more specific. There is such a thing as a healing anointing. Remember the woman with the issue of blood that pressed through the crowd and touched the hem of Jesus' garment? Jesus said that he felt that virtue went out of him. What was that virtue? That was a healing, anointing, and power that flowed out of him and flowed into that woman and produced a healing and a cure. Amen? There were people that touched the hem of his garment. There were people that Peter shadow the glory of God that was around Peter. That healing, anointing came on people, and those that even came within his shadow were healed. There were, pe there were people that Jesus laid his hands on them and he touched them. What was he doing when he was touching them? He was releasing the healing anointing. Amen? What am I saying? There is such a thing as a healing anointing. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says, The same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you. That's the healing anointing. It is because you and I as believers have a tangible healing anointing that is abiding within our spirit. That is why the Bible says, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they will do what? Lay hands on the sick. What for? So that they can transmit that healing anointing. And that healing anointing will flow when there's faith involved. Providing nothing short circuits the faith. And what I'm saying is that the faith will flow and that healing anointing will flow through faith. And the way you activate your faith is by forgiving. Can you see that? Amen. All right. So now let's let's, let's go here and then we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. Actually, 
Yeah, let's flip over to Luke. But in, on the way, let's just stop at Luke chapter 7. I want to show you a verse. Now, this is a particular story where Jesus went into the home of, a, um, uh, of um, this guy named Simon. That's Luke chapter 7. Read it from about uh, verse 36. We're not going to read the verses. And one of the Pharisees had invited him to his house. I think the Pharisee name was Simon. Jesus came. The Pharisee didn't, didn't wash his feet or anything else. But there was this woman, which was a woman of the night kind of thing that came. And she washed his feet with his tears. And she kissed his feet. And she anointed it with ointment. And the Pharisee thought, this Jesus, doesn't he know? Doesn't he know who this woman is? How can he allow her, her to be touching him? And Jesus, knowing his mind, Jesus said to him, Simon, let me ask you something. I came to your house. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't do any of that stuff. And then he told him, look, there was a certain creditor who had 500 pences and the other had 50. And, and when they had, they had nothing, to, that had, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. One of them owed him 500 pence and another one owed him 50. And when neither of them had anything to pay, the one that forgave them, bo he forgave them both. But tell me, which one do you think loved him the most? And of course, of course, Simon said, the one that was forgiven most. And Jesus said, yes, you've you, you spoken rightly. This woman has been forgiven most, so she loves me the most. And you see all these tears? You see her kissing my feet? You see her wiping my feet with her hair? This is a manifestation of her love and her confidence and her faith towards me. You didn't treat me like that. And then Jesus said something in verse 47. He says, wherefore I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Because she loved much, but unto whom little is forgiven, he loved little. And he said to her, thy sins. And he turned to the woman, and he says, woman, your sins are forgiven you. And they that sat at, at the table, they began to say within themselves, who is he that forgiveth sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In other words, this lady, because of her faith, here came forgiveness. So there's a relationship between faith and forgiveness. Her faith released forgiveness. Well, I'm also saying that forgiveness can release your faith. Now, I'm going to show you that in Luke chapter 17. And, uh, and we're going to more than likely close here. Amen? Yes, we're going to close here. Luke chapter 17. That's right. Luke chapter 17. Um, now, here's the situation. Let me read from <clears throat> verse 1. Then said he, then said... Then said he unto the, the, the disciples, it is impossible for offense to not come. Offense is going to come. You're going to get offended. It's coming your way. Sooner or later, somebody's going to offend you. But woe unto them by whom um, they come. It would be better for him to have a milestone hung around his neck than be, uh, and be cast into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. Now, here's what, what I want you to see. Verse 3. He says, look, you take heed to yourself. If your brother trespass against you or offends you, rebuke him. If he trespass or sins against you, rebuke him. But if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against you again, seven times in one day, and seven times in a day he turned to you and he said, I repent, you will forgive him. Now when Jesus said seven times a day, he will, and in another place he says 70 times seven. The whole point Jesus was saying, if he offend you over and over and over and over and over and he repent, you are to forgive him. Amen? So what was Jesus talking about? Forgiveness. Now, here, the, the, the disciples in verse 5 says, And the apostles said unto him, Lord, increase our faith. What are they saying? They say, I must forgive that many times. Man, I don't know if I can do it. He says, increase. They say, increase our faith. And Jesus said, in other words, how am I going to forgive all these times? Increase our faith. And Jesus answered two questions in one. He said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will say, Jesus was saying the way you increase your faith is by using it. But he was also saying the way you forgive is by faith. Amen? How do I forgive in this situation? By faith. I forgive because God has forgiven me. I forgive for Jesus' sake. Because the word of God says that I should. I forgive for the sake of the gospel. Amen? And then when you, <clears throat> and then when you forgive, you are also releasing your faith. So let me review it by saying this. The law of faith is a law. And we, must not forget, and we must not forget that law. But rather, we must walk in harmony with that law. Because faith, the Bible says, it is a faith that it might be by grace. 
Romans 4, verse 16. That way the promise is available to all the seed. And again in Galatians, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, you are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift, not, any, not of works as any man should boast. That grace flows through faith. So the law of faith is important. And there are certain principles. You want to get all of your being in harmony with that law. Every part of you, you want to get in agreement with, the, with, with what you're believing, with what the Word of God says, with what the promise of God says. So first of all, you believe. Where do you believe from? From the depths of your heart. You meditate on the Word of God, get a hold of the Word of God, and you believe it in your heart. Get it into your heart. Number two, you set your will, your mind, and your emotions in harmony with your believing. Number three, you take it in that you act upon the Word. Number four, you, 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 you have it. You, you confess that you have it. Because if you act on it, the Bible says, when you pray, you are to believe you receive it. So, now you act on it. Now, I mean, now you begin to confess that I got it. And, I th and then number five, you thank God for it. And then number six, you forgive. Is there anyone I need to forgive anywhere? I forgive. I forgive everybody, left, right, and center. I forgive. And by so doing, you release your faith. And Jesus says, when you do that, for his sake, you're going to receive a hundredfold. When, and then when you come boldly to the throne of grace, you're going to obtain mercy and you're going to find grace to help in time of need. Amen? So the whole thing is that faith worketh by love. And when you operate in forgiveness, you're operating in love and you're giving your faith a jump start. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Amen? So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to stretch forth my hand to anyone that is watching on this by website, television, or whatever other means, in the name of Jesus, that the anointing of God and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ might flow to you, might flow into your body, bring healing, bring strength, bring deliverance that would flow right into you, that would flow into your finances, your relationships, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In a moment, I'm going to release that anointing. And when I release that anointing, it will flow. And what I want you to do is I want you to say, I receive. And then I want you to say, I forgive everybody. And I forgive that particular person. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I stretch forth my hands right now. And by the power that is invested in the name of Jesus, and by the power that is behind that name, the very throne of God, Jesus says, the works that he do, shall I do also, and greater works than these. In the name of Jesus, the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead that dwells within me, that same resurrection power by which he spoiled principalities and powers, I release that power, I release that river of anointing to flow right now across these airwaves, to flow into my brother, to flow into my sister, to flow into that person's body. In the name of Jesus, and I curse every sickness, I curse every disease, I command every disease to die, disintegrate, Come out of your body in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and I release the anointing of healing and wholeness. And I say, be made whole from the crown of your head to the tip of your toe. I furthermore, I send the anointing into your finances to destroy poverty and lack and produce supernatural favor and increase in your life. In Jesus' name. Now I want you to say, I receive. And I want you to say, I forgive everybody. And I forgive that one in particular. In the name of Jesus, amen.